one's an external influence and the other's an internal influence, what would you try to do? Quantify how much is needed. Yes. You want to deconstruct the cause changes that have occurred in the last 30 years into Bowen and Baumel facts and see which one of them is largest. All right? The first thing to do is to find out if both of these theories actually cause the cause to rise. All right? Because uh, it might be either or. Turns out it's not either or. Your intuition would have told you that in the first place. Clearly, some of our costs in higher education are going to be driven by the macro economy. We buy resources from the macro economy. We hire people from the macro economy. Clearly, the macro economy has to provide some influence on what our costs are going to be. So, concluding that, that Bobble has no influence, you know, that's just not going to happen. All right? The question is the difference between the two. All right? So, this is what Carter Hill, uh, my colleague from back in the old days, He's another old geezer like me, but he's an econometrician, which makes it possible. All right, we started out with this, and we did uh, this study, uh, and you can find it in the SSRN, that's the Social Science Research Network, uh, listed there under either my name or Carter's, uh, Carter's name. Econometric modeling to do exactly that, to deconstruct cost changes on the period from 1987 to 2011. All right, see if we decide which one it was. The first thing we found is the variables that you would associate with Bommel are significant, and the variables that you would associate with uh, Bowen's rule are significant. So that tells you immediately that both of those uh, influences, the internal and the externals, um, uh, provide the uh, provide a, a drive, if you will, or a cause of an increase in, in costs as a result. The next thing is to say, how are we going to figure out uh, how much comes from each of them? Well, thank God for partial differentials. Um, so we take our model and we use the partial differential approach and estimate the cost changes within the sample. So we're actually forecasting uh, the, uh, the differences in the cost within the sample experience. Those of you who have statistics background realize that that the, the, the statistics are a lot more reliable when you're working inside the sample rather than outside the sample, all right? So we, uh, uh, we estimate the model with fixed effects, use the partial differential approach to identify the, uh, the, the Bommel and the Bowen effects. And what we found in that is at least two-thirds of the increase in cost for student from 87 to 2011 come from decisions taken inside higher education. So in other words, it's Bowen's rule. So, they both influence cost, but clearly the most important influence on cost is um, Bowen's rule. And when that conclusion says the cost problem is of our own making, we own this problem. You know, this is not imposed on us from the outside. It's something that we have neglected for a very long period of time, uh, and it's going to be very difficult. Those of you who know anything about uh, uh, institutional politics, no, it's going to be very difficult to do anything about this. Michigan is probably a good example of, of what uh, I'm talking about here. Wait, can I go back one? I'll try one. Did I do it? Did I call it twice? No, this, this is it. Okay, so what is it that's, that's doing this? Well, it's a, it's a concept known as bureaucratic entry. Right? You physicists will, will find that term. Uh, we'll recognize that term, right? Yeah. Well, what it is is the tendency of nonprofit institutions to increase the number of employees faster than the number of people served. Now, when that happens, the algebra is really clear, <laughs> all right? The cost has to go up. You cannot do that without driving the cost up, okay? Uh, now, where this term came from, bureaucratic entry, was from studies of the relationship uh, between municipal workers and the population of the city. And what they found there, systematically, was that municipal workers grew faster than the population. Now, think about that for a moment. There ought to be uh, economies of scale in public city services. In other words, it should be going in the opposite direction. So what's going on here? Why would that happen? You know, well, the answer is the bureaucratic 
that instrument. The second uh, sort of historical thing is Parkinson's Law. How many of you have heard of that term before? Okay. Uh, this is uh, from a guy named Cyril Parkinson, who was a uh, long-term civil servant in, uh, in England, who noticed after World War II, when the, uh, the foreign office, excuse me, when the colonial office was shut down and all of the people who were employed in the colonial office were moved over to the foreign <laughs> office, he noticed an odd thing. There were no more colonies to be administered at that point because they'd all been set free after World War II, but the level of employment in the colonial office was at an <clears throat> historical high. There were more people employed in the colonial office at the time when there were no colonies than there were at the peak of uh, the expanse of the British uh, of the British Empire. And so he began to think about that, and he began to notice it uh, in other kinds of experiences. And so he developed uh, what's referred to as Parkinson's Law. And basically, he his law states that. Uh, um, there are objectives, the two objectives of, um, of bureaucrats is to increase the number of people, one is to increase the number of people working for them, and then the second one is to create more work for other bureaucrats. Now, first of all, if you look at that second one, you think, why in the world would they be doing that? Well, because the first objective of all the other bureaucrats is to hire more people, right? So it's a symbiotic relationship between the bureaucrats. That in Parkinson's law. Uh, this result of the tendency of uh, the employees to grow faster than the number of people being served is also found in the economic theory of bureaucracy. Same thing. You find the same thing. You find in those models of bureaucracy that the, the um, objective of the individual bureaucrat is to maximize discretionary budget because discretionary budget is a function of the number of people you have employed. The more people you have employed, the larger the discretionary budget is. The larger the discretionary budget is, the more opportunities to take personal rent in terms of um, either um, perks or in terms of capital equipment or in terms of legion, for example, the more people you have working for you, and the larger the discretionary budget. So it is a common problem, and interestingly enough, it is a problem in all for-profit firms. So have you ever wondered why for-profit firms are habitually restructuring themselves? <laughs> you know about uh, the uh, re-engineering of uh, for-profit firms in the 80s and the 90s and uh, all the stress that caused on people when so many people lost their jobs in middle management in, uh, in for-profit firms? Well, that's the for-profit response to bureaucratic entropy, right? They have to avoid it because if they do not avoid it, what happens? If they don't avoid, if they don't avoid it, if they avoid, it, if they if they don't do something about it, and their customer, their competitors do, what happens to the firm? Well, they go bankrupt. I'm saying so. It's a survival issue to them, right? And they have the, the, the incentives are properly aligned for them to do something about this, okay? Because not to do something about it means they're, it's an existential problem for them. They won't exist after that. Okay. So that is uh, the, the bureaucratic entropy. What's the entropy part of this? Anybody, anybody know? What does what does entropy mean? I can't, I can't resist my classroom teaching experiences. <clears throat> yeah, disorder. Disorder. The, the organized system descends into disorder, right? Chaos. Chaos. Right. Okay. So, what's the entropy part here? What happens when when this goes completely unchecked and all these bureaucrats are out there making work for everybody else? What happens to those people who are actually providing the service? The service at the point of the spear. Swamped by numbers. Swamped by the jobs they're being asked to do, 
from uh, from those who are in, in the bureaucracy. Yes. And so once they get, what happens to quality? What happens to uh, uh, service output? Everything else that goes with it. Okay. So that's the entropy part of that. Is that if you don't do something about it, eventually the institution is going to collapse. The organization is going to collapse. All right. Now, what are the effects of bureaucratic entropy in higher education? <laughs> It's all about staffing, right? So you ought to find it in the staffing pattern, shouldn't you? All right? So what happens when we look at staffing patterns across the board from 87 to, say, 2011? Well, the first thing you find is a really very rapid increase in the number of non-academic professional staff per 100 students. Uh, there's only one other rate of increase in staffing ratios that is even who are close to that. And guess what that is? What other category of staffing has been increasing at more or less the same rate? No, no, no within the higher education institutions. Part-time faculty. Okay. So, uh, very intensive use of contract faculty and part-time faculty. 